Dragon Ball, a legendary enemy that's been around for almost four decades. A true cultural phenomenon that has transcended generations and inspired countless works of fiction. It didn't just stand out in its time, it soured. Which in a level of global influence so massive that even my grandpa knows who Goku is. But for all its success, Dragon Ball isn't exactly perfect. In fact, if you stack it up against newer series like One Piece, Naruto or Hunter, you could argue that it's lacking in a lot of areas. In terms of the plot, as soon as you shine a magnifying glass on it, you can notice that it's riddled with plot holes and issues which we tend to overlook because we don't really take it too seriously. A lot of times, character decisions seem radical, illogical or weird. Some power-ups feel a little unearned or sloppy. And a lot of events happen for reasons that contradict some of the rules established before in the series or maybe after that event. Well, without getting into so many specifics, it is safe to say that the newer shows can be Dragon Ball in most, if not all of the categories. And the later continuations have a lot of issues and they are surrounded by work that transcended it in quality. And even though, and despite all of that, it still remains well received and loved and makes bank almost every single time. Proving once again that the fan base is still far larger than the most popular shows of the time. Dragon Ball took the father of anime title too seriously. It's basically the overpowered cool MC's dad that steals the show whenever he shows up and gets away with being a bad dad. I mean, he wouldn't make a lot of money if he wasn't as popular and as successful, right? But what is his secret? What is it about Dragon Ball that makes it so captivating? How can a story with so many flaws still manage to enchant fans across generations? To understand this, let's go back where it all started, to the origins of this legendary series, and analyze how its evolution affected us and the anime fandom as a whole. Dragon Ball started off as a manga in 1985, written and illustrated by Akira Toriyama, following a kid named Goku on his journey to find his grandpa's shiny big balls, which were rumored to grant you a wish if gathered all together. In its early phases, Dragon Ball was more lighthearted and comedic, with Goku being something of a gag character, like an early Saitama, and it was meant to be a short story ending when the Dragon Balls are found. But after Dragon Ball gained traction and popularity in Japan, Toriyama shifted the story from a playful adventure to a more intense fight-driven series. And this evolution would transform not only Dragon Ball, but the entire shonen genre, as it is the first of its kind to mix humor with action. The manga's rising popularity helped break records and set a standard for future series like Naruto and One Piece. Many see Dragon Ball as a driving force behind manga's rise in popularity, reaching new cultural significance in Japan and eventually paving the way for anime's global reach. Toy Animation noticed the potential of Dragon Ball early on and launched an anime adaptation in 1986. The adaptation helped the manga gain more sales and the manga helped spread word about the show. After the first part ended, Goku was already the strongest on earth. He got married to Chi Chi, defeated King Piccolo, the biggest threat in the story and it could have ended there. Toei and Shonen Jump both wanted more, seeing it as a cash grant, so they asked Toriyama to extend the series once more, and he once again made an outstanding decision, because what he wrote next turned out to be the best part in all of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. Ah yes, everyone's favorite, this is the part that launched Dragon Ball from Japan to the international level. Dragon Ball introduced concepts and ideas that can be seen as alien to many adventure type shows of the time. The battles reached power levels unseen before in all of fiction, with fights that literally threatened to destroy planets and solar systems. If we look back, Dragon Ball Z was so damn absurd and bizarre. The first part was weird already. You know, talking animals, humans with eyes on their forehead, shiny balls that if gathered together would summon a dragon that can make your wishes come true, the god of earth living in the clouds. This cat is probably stronger than most of the martial artists on earth, but even with all of that, it hasn't reached a level of weird that sets it apart from other works. Dragon Ball Z takes it to the next level. Toriyama's idea to extend the show was to give a little more context to Goku's backstory. He realized that there is more to this dumb kid with a tail. He was actually sent to Earth in a capsule after his home planet was destroyed. Which sounds familiar at first glance. It seems like he's just another version of Superman, an evil version of him, as he was supposed to conquer Earth, but decided to play Aladdin in 
Lestad, a selfish Aladdin that refused to free the magical dragon Shinron from the Balma misery and chose to abuse him by reviving the roster every time they die to a new villain. And this Superman also happens to be a Wolverine turning into an ape upon seeing a full moon, green looking genderless creatures that hatch eggs to reproduce, plants that turn into humanoid creatures that are basically 10 times stronger than a piccolo who could blast the moon, casually blasting planets with a wave of your hands. Or no better, a lizard that can blast a planet with a wave of its finger. Also, did you know that you can get 50 times stronger by yelling for an hour? You can also kill your main character in episode 6 and get away with it. Hell, you can do it twice, why not? If you enter this mosque looking building, you can spend an entire year in a single day as a cheat code to beat your enemies. Hypothetically, if you wanted twins and you only managed to get one child, enter the chamber and reproduce and deliver there, leave the child outside and by the time you get out you basically have twins also if you died mid fight and you still want to help your friends no problem you can just use this god as a galactic telephone and cheer them up or use this tv in hell to do the opposite the only thing that differentiates a dead man from an alive one is a yellow halo on top of your head if you concentrate just a little bit you can float if you dance in a specific rhythm you will merge with someone else the point is this absurd and weirdness could be the main reason why it was so engaging at the time. After all, it was new to us and had very unique ideas. And it didn't matter if they made any sense, because at this point, logic and Dragon Ball are two parallel lines that do not meet. Absurdity and bizarreness tend to be entertaining. And if you add to it the amazing characters, the story they tell, and the development they gain over time, it can get even better. Vegeta, Piccolo, and Gohan, each one of them had a story to tell and a meaning behind their development and this added a whole other layer to the show and created many emotional moments found family identity growth morality and many other themes that were explored throughout the show that made it more than just meaningless conflicts and fights as they deliver through the messages that bring back value to us beyond just entertainment and this helps us create a special bond with this show and the greater the bond the greater the emotions we feel as we watch the show these emotions emotions can reach their peak when our favorite characters die or when the most exciting development occurs. And what was more exciting in the show than the Super Saiyan transformation? One of the most chilling and ghost bumping transformations of all time, happening at the climax of the Freeza arc. Goku witnesses his best friend Krillin explode in front of him as both of them stood helpless. The great anger within Goku awakened a power within him, transforming his hair yellow, making it stand up and making the hairs on our bodies stand up with him. Goku and himself was for the most of the time goofy and uh, rarely do we see him angry and when we do we see him transform and get exponentially stronger. It was so amazing to witness and so iconic that it started a long lasting transformation trope seen in all major shonen enemies since then. Thanks to its success it reached the international stage in around 1996, popularizing not only itself but the whole anime industry, reaching millions, tens of millions of people around the world and inspiring other shows that came after it. It helped introduce anime to the rest of the world and newer generations. There is no wonder it recently won the award of the best anime in history, as it means a lot to Japanese people. Dragon Ball Z without a doubt was the peak of the franchise and the most successful part. I watched it as a kid before I was able to differentiate between anime and cartoon and I was absolutely hooked. And who wouldn't be after hearing the Arabic version of Dragon Ball Z opening? That song was like a fucking national anthem and created such an unreal hype and it left such a huge impact on us, becoming almost impossible to forget. Unfortunately, because we can't ignore the fact that GT happened. Ever since that time, the franchise entered what we would call a production slumber in which no new series or manga chapters were released and despite no obvious plan from Akira to continue the show, Toei kept 
kept the franchise alive by releasing games such as Dragon Ball Z Budokai series to extend its popularity into PlayStation 2. This series received a massive success and extended further into Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi series. Perhaps the success of the games have inspired Toei to reproduce Dragon Ball to match the development of television. And so, they would release Dragon Ball Kai, a remake of Dragon Ball Z minus the filler, which set forth for extending the series further when finally, Akira changed his mind again, decided to release the Battle of Gods movie. You know, trying things out, seeing if anybody is still interested, and they received yet another huge success, reviving the legacy of Dragon Ball and creating a golden opportunity that Tui capitalized on, releasing a new canon continuation after almost 20 years, Dragon Ball Super. These news were almost seductive to the grown-ass nerds who grew up watching the show and were waiting since decades for the Super Saiyan 13 transformation. Dragon Ball Super extended the world building even more. Remember the gods from Dragon Ball Z? Turns out there are gods above those gods which were also above the gods on Earth and it turns out you can be millions of times stronger if your hair was red instead of just yellow. 50 times more if it's blue instead of red. And I don't know how much more if it's white or a darker shade of blue. Pink is also great, as good as red or blue I think. I don't know, the power scaling doesn't mean anything anymore. At some point they stopped using numbers and at another point it didn't matter at all. But we didn't care if these things made sense anymore because we missed the show. It's been more than two decades and a lot of us who grew up watching the show now have families and jobs with no hope of a return for the show. We're happy it's even here and we can finally relive those iconic moments that were cemented in our memories as we watched the show when we were young. The new episodes made us feel a nostalgic feeling and Toei played mainly on that, bringing back to the spotlight Roshi, Tien, Trillin, 17, 18, Frieza and Piccolo. Sometimes they would make Gohan and Piccolo train together, Goku and Krillin training under Roshi once more. Toei knew what they were doing and they had to. After all, Dragon Ball is now competing with other fascinating shonen series and it has more competition than ever. It fell behind for the most part, especially after Resurrection failure. But once the Tournament of Power arrived, Dragon Ball once again managed to do what no other enemy did before it. After countless transformations, Goku broke his limitations as well as the entire internet with his Ultra Instinct transformation and with a concept different than merely multiplying your power. Goku has acquired the ability to instantly dodge or attack, which with the music looked so freaking cool. The Ultra Instinct kicks in when you are in your worst shape, so it comes to save you in the last moment. The trigger was no longer just training or getting angry, and this was unheard of in the world of Dragon Ball. The stakes are much higher than they ever were, the entire universe at stake, and no one could predict what could happen. Dragon Ball Super had a unique situation with no manga or novel to peek into to know what would happen next, relying only on the few Twitter leaks and the frames of dialogue lines an hour prior to the show airing. Some people would rush to watch the show without translation out of excitement just to know what would happen next. In that tournament arc, each beloved character was given his chance to shine again and we couldn't help but appreciate it, grouping all the mighty warriors of Universe 7, including those who were previously antagonists, even Frieza. The fact that they were once enemies and now they are all fighting together against a giant threat and seemingly impossible odds played again on nostalgia. Using the villain redeeming strategy was probably Dragon Ball's best method. And that's because we once had our most focus on these antagonists and they were hyped up so much before. At their peak, they might have been someone's favorite character or favorite period of the show, which is why seeing them shine again brings us so much joy. This strategy works is because it carries with it a message in its core. Even those who have made horrible mistakes, if given a second chance can turn for the better, which installs hope in our hearts that we could do better and become better people. And the endless power-ups tell us that no matter how good we do, we still have an infinite potential within us and we can always do more. One of the biggest reasons Dragon Ball Super was so successful is because the powerful sense of nostalgia it brought to the fans, reviving the memories we once had as we watched Goku's adventures after we came back from school. Dragon Ball made us feel so many strong emotions as we were kids helping us create a bond so strong that would help us forgive the series when it doesn't quite hit the mark. We would overlook its flaws
cause, like forgiving a sibling for their mistakes, because we love it not for what it delivers for us right now, but for what it means for us. A part of Dragon Ball's charm is its simplicity. It's mostly straightforward, rarely bogged down by complicated plots or deep philosophical themes. The Goku Black arc is about as close as the series gets to a complex storyline. Even that one keeps it relatively accessible. Most arcs center around one or two incredibly strong enemies, setting up a familiar pattern. The Z fighters struggle, the villain appears unbeatable, and Goku, often mysteriously absent until the last possible moment, returns to take on the challenge. This simple structure makes it easy to follow and endlessly entertaining as it avoids repetition in a clever way, as Goku is absent for different reasons every single time, allowing the viewers to get swept up in the thrill without getting lost. Thanks to the show being simple, you can just turn off your brain and watch. You don't gotta concentrate like you do while watching Death Note. There is nothing to worry about. If anyone dies, there is a Dragon Balls or Namek Dragon Balls or whatever planet they gotta come up with next time. Each time the enemy is a gazillion times stronger than Goku, we get this underdog feeling at the moment as he arrives, and it works every single time. It's either the fact that Goku doesn't know the level of the threat and we're excited to see him lose, or that the antagonist doesn't know how strong Goku is and we are excited to see him surprised. And even if he wasn't strong, we know he gonna figure it out. He gonna turn his hair red, blue, white, zebra, Kaioken times 1000, no need to worry about it. Just watch as they continuously raise the bar of strength beyond infinity and break their own logic. Yeah, well, fuck logic. You already won our hearts and we would cheer you up even when you don't deliver. You can take this notion in football, for example. Once you pick a favorite club like Barca, it would be hard for you to cheer up for another club in the same way. Most Barca fans were hooked up by the dream team in 2009 to 2015 and remain loyal even at its worst times. And every time they see Barca performing near the level of their prime, they get a nostalgic feeling. When Barca used their signature move, Tiki Taka against Real Madrid in El Clasico, you can hear the crowd joyfully cheer. And that's because it reminded them of the time they dominated all of Europe. There are so many things that can stick to our minds, and nothing sticks harder than the character's signature moves. I mean, is there any anime fan on earth who didn't try to Kamehameha at some point? Spirit Bomb, Final Flash, Instant Transmission, Energy Charging Attack concepts were just too good. Dragon Ball has managed to embed itself in our lives, creating unforgettable memories that keep fans coming back with every new chapter. With each release, whether it's a game or a new series like the recent Dragon Ball Daima, fans are ready to embrace it, not just for the story, but for the feeling it brings back. Regardless how stupid the plot is gonna be, or how terrible Goku's no design is, we're still gonna watch and be thankful for Akira Toriyama for providing us with such a masterpiece that also caused other masterpieces to be created with it.